Well, there we have begun. Hi, I'm Dick Cavett, and you, <laughs> you surprised me. I was talking to my guest who has a terrible reputation <clears throat> for enchanting people. Yeah. And I was caught off guard. <laughs> she is the sophisticated uh, and, uh, what shall I say, at times outspoken, a very uh, southern Julia Sugarbaker of designing women. But Dixie Carter hinted at her real passion in this episode, which was seen just a few weeks ago. Would you roll the tape, please? I think she's had too much champagne. No, she's fine. She's fine. Now Payne and his lovely bride, Sylvie, are about to leave for their honeymoon. But before they go, I want to just take a moment and sing a song for you. <laughs> it's a special song. One that I used to sing for Payne when he was just a little boy. <laughs> Hit it. Don't worry, Mom never takes her clothes off unless they throw money. Good heavens, Dixie. It seemed your behavior was slightly inappropriate to the setting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, should I say that uh, Miss Carter, and it's Mrs. Carter and Miss Carter, we'll get into that perhaps, is a singer by training at heart, and you can catch her cabaret act at the Cafe Carlisle this month, and Dixie Carter, welcome. After Thank all this you. Time. I'm so pleased that you've had me. You, you remember me from the QE2 20 years ago? I had a feeling. I was going to say one of those, you know, those people mm. who say, oh, was it Paris, Marseille, uh, Omaha? Where have we met? It was on a on the uh, On sea. the boat. Right. On the boat going to England. We were children. I was with my first husband. And I was, I a, was a mere child. <laughs> I was a baby. That's right. I hadn't even had my children. I only had one baby then. My wife and you were me. so assiduous. Every night in your studies in the library, you would go in and work. Do you remember that you did that? You must in have the me library. Oh, no, you did. Alistair Cook or yeah. something. No, that was you the did. only place I could go. It was quiet enough to read comic books. In. I had my comic books with me. Oh. <laughs> well, it's, it, it was kind of flattering to feel that I had met you because when you see someone, and then one day my wife said, Remember you met on a ship? And uh, yeah. I, might, I know Dix Carter, I don't have to wait. Uh, every time I read an interview with you, the person comes away and it's under a spell, enchanted, bewitched, uh, people of all sexes and creeds and <laughs> so on. <laughs> and uh, I remember Miss Hepburn saying once, you can just turn it on if you have to. Can you just turn it on when you talk to the press and win them over? What a question. That's a tough one. Well, I try. I try my best to be yeah. pleasing and to be entertaining since I think that's what I'm supposed to do. And it isn't very difficult for me to be excited about interviews because it's not an old thing for me. You know, this is my first hit, Designing Women. And uh, I'm not 18 anymore, and I'm, I'm just thrilled with the whole deal, you know. You're glad about it. I, I... Certainly not at all blasé, not at all jaded about it. I'm thrilled about it. One of the best times of your life, would you say? Yes, I, I would say so. Yeah. Unbelievable. I, uh, I, yes. In, in every way. Well, in that scene, uh, when they cut to some young ladies who seemed appalled, uh, and, and actually I thought of your daughters, I, I can't imagine, as colorful as you are, that there hasn't been one or two times when your daughters have thought, Mom, you're our mother and we go to Harvard. You know, I've got a story to tell you about that, about those girls, and that yeah. Annie Potts teases about this story. At one of my birthday, I always give myself a big birthday party, and, and uh, at one of my birthday parties, since the girls have been grown, I was uh. doing my usual, you know, drinking my champagne and kicking my heels up, something like we just saw. <laughs> and uh, the, my new friends, the other designing women, were watching all this go on, and they said afterwards, Dixie, do you know that most women who had 18, 19-year-old daughters seeing their mother get out in the yard and cavort like that would say, get mother in the house immediately. Yes. And instead, Throw something they over said, mother. you know, get mother behind. So get her down, get her out, get her out of the way. And the, but my girls just smile at me and just egg me on. They're angels. They are. They, I guess they'd have to be, would they? I mean, I, I, no, I didn't mean that. I meant that only in the best way. That being your daughter, <laughs> being your daughters. Oh, they would, thank you. They're they my would proudest be, feat yeah. accomplishment. My uh, girls are. Uh, are you married to anyone in particular? Hal Holbrook. I'm married to <laughs> you, booger. Yeah, he. <laughs> oh, that's part of your charm. <laughs>
Yes, he allowed me to, uh, in his dressing room once, to watch him transform himself into Mark Twain, and I've never gotten over it. Oh, I'm remiss. He told me to tell you hello and send you the warmest greetings. Oh, yes, uh, just now, leaving the I hotel hope you didn't room. send them to someone else by mistake. No, he yeah. sent those greetings yeah. to you. What an artist he is. Uh, he says... Uh, <clears throat> what I, an artist, I, I tried yes. to give him... I inadvertently gave him a great compliment once. I was watching him do his Twain, which I've seen several times. And at the time, I was reading Huck Finn for the fourth time or something. And watching Holbrook, Holbrook as Twain, I thought, when I go backstage afterwards, I'm going to tell him I've read his book four times now. I thought, wait, wait no, this isn't Mark Twain, it's Hal Holbrook. I mean, it was... Oh, but for a moment, I had that thought, his book. I have read his book. It's mysterious, um, isn't it? Now... He's doing Lear, you know, troubles. this year. He's doing King Lear. Oh, good. Uh, at the Cleveland... Uh, wow. Uh, Great Lakes uh, Theater Festival. He's going to uh. be going into rehearsal right after I get opened at the Carlisle. That's going to be something to see, Dick. Oh, that would be, be something splendid. To see. Boy. Yeah. He may be tough to live with for a while, though. Yeah. Yeah, Jerry Friedman's directing it, and he said to me, just don't grieve over the fact that you're not going to be around during rehearsals because Hal's going to be going through something that... Just as well to do alone. Yeah, yeah. People who play that role tend to have a rough time uh, at home. Well, especially if they have women around. And he's a perfectionist, you know. Yeah. He is a great artist. And you yourself set out to be an opera singer. And I don't understand what they mean by a voice not being big enough. Can't you be trained to get as much sound and volume? No. Mm -mm. It's I'm, there or it's not. I'm all wet. No, you're not, but that's a legitimate question, but <laughs> I don't have a good enough voice to yeah. sing opera. I have uh, the heart for it. It's one of those little quirks of fate that sometimes you think, well, God just wasn't, didn't have his attention on me completely. He gave me this terrific desire to sing yeah. and not quite the equipment to sing what I want to. When I was four, hearing it on the radio, I knew I had to get to New York and sing at the Metropolitan Opera, but I didn't have the pipes. Um, Stop the presses. What? You have no agent? Correct. Are you trying to start some sort of revolution in our business? Well, I believe after my experience in the theater and in the Hollywood, <laughs> <laughs> in that emotional desert of California, I believe that an agent can be indeed one of the most destructive elements in an actor's life. Indeed. I will never have an agent again. Tell me more. I have my friend Dale Davis, who is my manager. Yeah. I have a lawyer who uh, negotiates for me now, you know. And I believe that somebody has to think you're good to do you any good. And I I've never met an agent who really thought I was much good. I mean, it's embarrassing, but but it's, but it's the truth. The last agency I had, Triad, mm -hmm. uh, thought that the Carlisle Hotel was not... I kept saying, I think they'd hire me at the Carlisle if you'd just talk to them. And uh, finally somebody said, you know, Dixie, it really, that isn't enough of a job for us to, uh, to fool with. Little basically. hotel. To work in a little hotel so that's job. That's the Hollywood mentality, too. Mm -hmm. in, in New York, there is a certain life of the mind. There, there are a few gods. One of them is maybe at least pretension to intellectuality, if not the real thing. But in California, there's no pretense. Money is God, and if you can't be in a room that's bigger than the room at the Carlisle, then you can't find anybody who's wholeheartedly going to represent you. So the fact I, that could, it's I don't a... even want to get started on this, but yes, mm -hmm. I don't have an agent. The fact that it's a high-class, internationally recognized, <laughs> famous place to go, the Carlisle, but didn't cut any ice with your agent? No! Uh -huh. No, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you've convinced me. Uh, did you let them down gently uh, and, and just say um, with a polite letter? or? Uh, well, I'll you tell you the truth. My, use contract, any particular my phrase? contract had been up for almost three years and they didn't know about it. So. It was kind of easy for you. <laughs> So yeah. I, all I had to do was call attention to the fact that my contract was up. If you wanted to say get lost in a real down-home way that's vaguely printable, how would you say it? I, are there phrases from the down-home that you can use? Hmm. Go to grass and eat mullet. Did you ever hear that one? No. Well, you can just go to grass and eat mullet? I don't know what it means, but I've heard it. We'll get into that and other such phrases <laughs> right after this. <laughs> Again. You may wonder what we're talking about. We were just talking about the fact that Southerners, to me, have 
a great, this is no secret, great rich verbal tradition as you demonstrate. But talking about kids in the South today losing the great opportunity to hear the older folks tell the great stories and yeah. maybe television's killing off all that wonderful Maybe it stuff. is. I don't, television's doing a lot of damage. Yeah. Here we sit right on it, but saying mm -hmm. that, and that's, it's biting the hand at Fiji, but you know, I have this idea that if we all had a law imposed upon us that grandparents had to live with a family, the whole deal would be better, and, and the whole drug situation would... I think mm -hmm. that the dissolution of the family unit is uh, a serious, sad, horrible, tragic concern. And there go the stories and the family history out the window. And here comes TV with everything so fast, mm -hmm. and now we can click the channels from where we sit. So we don't even have to watch... Yeah. Uh, you know, they have to get our attention in 15 seconds or we're on, and I'm as guilty as anyone else. Programs that are designed for a short <laughs> attention span can themselves be clicked to other programs to other quickly, programs. so that pretty soon... Well, I'm terrible. The only ones that hold me, you know, are the nature shows. If you see a line just about mm -hmm. to get that wildebeest, uh, well, for me anyway, I stay with it <laughs> until well, I'm they kill wildebeest, anyway. Yeah. Some of the details of nest building lose me sometimes, <laughs> despite the sonorous tones in which they're narrated. But uh, in any case... <laughs> but a good snake or a good grizzly bear or a good lion, that will hold you. Well, you're right? used to all those <laughs> things from being down in the south where you got to be careful well, we swimming. You don't know what's swimming with Cotton you. It mass, could be a reptile. Yeah. And... <laughs> Oh, I envy you a southern upbringing, a southern childhood, and southern friends, and all that stuff. Um, I did hear one thing about you that I feel it's my duty to bring up. Uh, mm -hmm. That you went to a, a mind, a, cha a spirit channeler once. Rantha. Now, I tend to giggle at this, so maybe you can convince me that this was wise. <laughs> Oh, you may be talking to the wrong Dixie. one. <laughs> Keep the giggles off. <laughs> Rantha. Rantha. Rantha, that uh, spirit that comes through the beautiful blonde woman. Ah, so. You know, and there have been scandals now, and oh, some yeah, people yeah. say Rantha exists. And all of a sudden, she speaks like this, and her fingers curl up in mm -hmm. that sort of old, we think of, I don't yeah. know, Turkish. Some uh, huh. Rantha said something to me that made some sense. And that night, since I go right along with anything, I just believe everything, you know. So I, I said to Rampha, please come over and visit me. And that night, indeed, the fire started up in my fireplace with no one lighting it. Get out of here. No, no, I'm telling you, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. It did. But here's what Rampha said to me. I had been out in California for about a year, and Rampha said, you must get rid of your mirrors. You have bad mirror well now as a matter of fact i was yes. hanging around with a bunch of people it took me a year to realize i invite them over every friday night to my house and none of them ever invited me to theirs so i began to realize oh. that the food the free food and wine might have been more important to them than my adorable company anyway these people were your mirrors were they correct that seemed to be what rantha was saying in so rantha. then shortly after that i met hal holbrook yeah who thought i was a nice woman and, uh, and things changed. How did you know by mirrors she wasn't just complaining about your bathroom or something? I mean, you, you know that they speak in metaphors. I think Rantha meant speaking yeah. in, hmm? in whatever those kind of images are. It seems to me there are two possibilities. One is that Rantha is, in fact, possessed by, or this blonde woman is possessed by this, or we might grant that she thinks she is. Yes. Or she just figured out a great or way she, to make a lot of money. She should have an acting or part. she should have an act career but if yeah. it's acting it's really splendid mm -hmm. now see i think that some, there's something going on there i do if ramtha said get rid of your husband immediately would you weigh it in, in other ways besides ramtha's advice uh, just, i'm just curious would. i probably would okay <laughs> <laughs> uh, was the part actually written for you because the writer knew you yep. for the series this one, because you mean. that's yeah this, the current series. It's almost impossible for me to get a job by auditioning. So thank heavens for this. Uh -huh. I'm so nervous for an audition. It's, it's hard for me to uh, show any, anything that I can do. I had done a short-lived series called Filthy Rich, written by Linda Bloodworth Thomason. And when it was mm -hmm. over, and it was in the early 1980s, she said to me, 
You know that expression, we were in love, but the show closed. You know uh -huh. that, Dick, uh -huh. you know. Well, but Linda isn't one of those people. She said, I'm going to write you a part that's not going to be quite as bizarre the next time I get a chance, Dixie, and make a mainstream character that America will get to know. I promise I'm going to. And six years later, I guess. That's what happened. She called me up and said, I want to use your name. I want to go into a meeting with CBS. So, so she wrote it for me and Delta and Gene and Annie, all of us. Isn't that? Wonderful. That's uh, one in a million. We'll be right back with more. Mm -hmm. We're back with Dixie Carter. Uh, people pay a fortune to get a cabaret act written, sweat throughout their lives, have try it and fail, and never seem to find their image or all of that. Mm. And Hal apparently suggested the idea from the beginning. But was it his whole idea that you do a cabaret act? It was his idea. Or his idea what you do in a cabaret. No, I make it up myself, yeah. more or less. Every description I've read of it makes me want to be there. It sounds like a I wish you'd come evening. this time. You and Carrie and I come I doubt if I can get time. in. It sounds, it's a small room and... I'll get you in if you want to come. Don't you worry about that. If you see my nose pressed to the glass. Oh! <laughs> that is so much fun to be singing up there in front yeah. of that piano and see people outside who are looking in uh -huh. and kind of making up their mind. Then if there's an extra seat, they push the door open and come in. Yeah. It's wonderful. So uh, Mabel Mercer was a great heroine. You you probably loved Mabel Mercer. I like Mabel Mercer a lot, and and uh, th there's a certain kind of performing in a room just that size that you can't get anywhere else. And it, when it's working, it's, it's a warm, it's like wonderful feeling. your living room. Feeling. Well, that's why Hal suggested that I do it. Yeah. He said, Dixie, why don't you just go ahead and make a cabaret act and see if you can sing someplace? Because I would m imprison my dinner guests, you know, just mm -hmm. bar the front door and get out the champagne and say, now y'all sit down and, and sing for them yeah. for hours at a time. And he said, everybody <laughs> likes it, and you love it, obviously, so do it. So I have. Cosmetic surgery, someone said to me to mention to you. I assume they're referring to the song of the same name. And Correct. From, from your act. Last year, I did in that place in the show a John Wilowich, you know John, John Wilowich song called I'm 27. Mm -hmm. And this year, I'm going to tell the audiences I can't do it anymore because I'm 28 now, so... <laughs> I'm doing cosmetic surgery. Can I just start off the song for you, tell you a few words? I You'll do. You'll think it's adorable, I bet you. I'd be thrilled. All my friends are getting younger than ever. Look at Binky and Dora and Fred. Though their morals are loose, their flesh is taut. In a matter of weeks, with the modern techniques for improving physiques, they have altered their beaks and they've lifted their cheeks, and now everyone speaks in society's cliques of the changes that science has wrought, of the changes that money has bought. <laughs> Isn't that a good beginning? That sounds a little Noel Cowardish, doesn't it? So he might write for his Vegas act. John's yet. stuff sounds a little bit uh -huh. that way. He's been a big influence, or helped you, hasn't he? Yes. He and I have remained friends now for 25 years. I love old friendships, don't you? Yes. It's if better if it... One's lucky enough to have if, some. If, yeah. yeah. If they turn out to be true and good and loyal, yeah. it's great. And so I, I'm, I'm making a record with John. Uh, the 16th of April. The, oh, I wish you could come and see. <clears throat> the Carlisle's letting us use the room. We're going to call it Dixie Carter Sings John Wallowich at the Carlisle, and it's going to be all his songs. It's not that I'm interested. It's we're out of time in this segment. We'll be right back. <laughs> I'm talking with Dixie Carter, who's pretending to be impressed with me. Well, I am impressed. You speak Japanese. I speak some Japanese, not all of it. There are whole areas of the language that I don't speak. Well, that's true of English, you know, too, for to, most of us, anyway. Even you said you speak English. Yeah, but there must be millions of things we don't know how to say in yes. English, so... Egregious. So. I always forget what egregious means. What's pellucid? These are words that I wonder... Wh Those words what that they no matter mean? how many times you run across them, no matter how many times you look them up, you have to talk about them Then you don't again. know them. Yeah, so it's a... Uh, those are my two bones of contention right now, but please let's go on about the whatever we were talking People about. often watch uh, for advice on television, and in the minutes we have remaining, you talked in an article about having had two marriages and now a very happy one. Have you learned from those anything you could advise somebody about what not to do? And do you think anybody's experience applies to anybody else? I don't know one thing about it. I think I'm, I, I just think I'm lucky now. You did I say try to be nice now. I yeah. try to be kind. I try to remember that we hurt each other's feelings without meaning to, but yeah. I'm, I have no words of wisdom at all. You did say that 
to, a, I believe, a lady interviewer that after 40, men just fall from trees. Well, that is nice. Does that mean they're... They, I don't know. That's a good happens. thing. I mean, they're not well, over... Oh, well, I thought they it was overripe? Good. I didn't know why the fruit I... image of the men falling from the trees or the... <laughs> nuts, what, what falls from trees? I, I'm, I'm, I don't know whether I said fall. I don't, I don't mean trees, to be flippant. I just. I think that young men, all of a sudden, when you're too old for them, in your 30s, uh -huh. at 40, all of a sudden, they become very interested in you. Young men recognize the value of an older woman. Yes, older but you than have 30. to get you have to get 40 to come into this glorious attention. Is that the best time for a woman, if she plays her cards right, I wonder? Of course, I'm 33 now, I've decided. I liked it before, and I've gone back to it. So I don't even know what I'm doing this 40 talk for. I haven't raised... <laughs> did I raise the question of age or anything anything resembling it? Dixie, rather quickly, could you fill people in on the reaction that one episode got about that, when you made that speech to the class reunion, at the class reunion, about the... Do you, know, do you know the thing I'm referring to, and you, about, it revolves being overweight? And that was Delta's speech. Yeah. Delta had a, a show about her weight, mm -hmm. and uh, I figured a little bit in it. Uh, Delta had a problem with she her weight. She made the speech. She made the speech. She's been in all well, now the. Uh, caught me in an imposture because I didn't actually she, she's see She's been in all the, you know, the tabloids. Yeah. And very hurtfully so. And so we did a show for her to be able to answer everybody about her oh, weight. Oh, and it was her being overweight. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Because it didn't figure to me, and I thought I'll pretend I saw it. And, uh, well. No. <laughs> God, the way women can unmask you in public, it's just amazing. Well, you were never better than you were in that episode where you were overweight. <laughs> <laughs> You're a stunning actress and have an amazing resume, and there's hardly anyone you haven't worked thank with you. at all. And well, I don't know why the you. whole country isn't just beating a path to your door. But they no. certainly will to the Carlisle in New York City at the Carlisle Hotel, I'm The sure. month of April? Yeah. I hope they'll come opening April the 3rd and playing through the 28th. Well, I hope you'll come back sometime and show us the bad, ugly, unpleasant sides of you that you've so skillfully considered. <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> nice to see you, there, Dixie there. Carter. Good luck nice at the hotel. See we'll see you next time. And so long.